So I know it's been quite some time since um, my last Q&A podcast. Um, But with that being said, um, after the last fight, I just wanted to take some time to myself and regroup and just kind of decompress, figure things out. And um, so after the fight, I just hit a road trip and took my dog and um, it was amazing. I went hiking. I, I drove from I started in Kansas City. I went, I flew there actually and cornered my friend Cindy and she uh, won her fight against Jessman Duke, which was obviously amazing. And then um, from there, I drove to Colorado Springs. I hiked the incline. Um, and then I drove from there all the way to Vegas and I stayed there for like eight hours. I didn't even spend the night in my house. And I actually, um, drove straight to LA to meet up with my friends, uh, Nick Lee and Travis, um, stayed, stayed in a hotel with them. And then I just continued on up, um, the one one and, um, just had a beautiful drive, uh, along the coast and just did a lot of soul searching, a lot of hiking, saw a lot of cool things. It was very spontaneous, went all the way up to Washington. Um, and I went to a watershed, which was also really cool. And then I drove back down and it was just epic. And uh, I really feel like I needed it. I definitely needed to regroup. Um, but with that being said, it really was quite an amazing experience. And um, I recommend it to anyone. Like once a year, I think everyone should go on a road trip and just be spontaneous and get out of of the norm of things and just experience life a little bit. And sometimes solo road trips are just awesome because you kind of shut out the whole noise of the world and um, you just learn a lot about yourself. It's funny because you think you know yourself better than anyone or you think you you know yourself really well, but you'd be surprised how much you learn about yourself when you take time for yourself. And um, I definitely felt very refreshed and very... Um, regrouped and willing to get back into, um, really hard training and, you know, more motivated. I just needed to like take a time out for a second. I've been on the grind for such a long time, but I'm definitely very excited to get the Misha Tate show going again. I do love doing my podcast. And, um, since the, the hiatus, I've released two episodes, one with Dr. Edwards and um, one with a, a couple really good friends of mine who actually helped me produce this podcast. So that um, that would be Lacey and Chris. And um, they're just amazing people who share my vision of passion. And they're in a completely different direction with their passion, but it's a similar language. Passion is passion. And we had a, a really great talk. So if you want to listen to that one, that's the most recent one before this one. And then, um, so yeah, back to the the podcast and the questions. So I, I did post on my Facebook and asked if there was any questions that, um, you would like to submit and have answered. So I went ahead and picked out some that I think would be, um, suitable for this, this podcast. And, um, I'll go ahead and start with Rob. First question is, how dark were the days when you lost to Miss Ronda Rousey? And how do you reconcile that darkness in conjunction with the victory over Miss Holm? Which tools within yourself allowed you to fight towards the brighter day? Well, that's a that's um, a very heavy question, a very loaded question. But um, I'm happy to answer it. Um, you know, when I lost to Ronda, I mean, I've been pretty honest in this, in that it was horrible. It was just one of the worst feelings in the world. And it sucks anytime you put a lot of work into something and it just doesn't go your way. And, um, it was really, really, really hard on me as, as one could imagine, you know? And, um, that's when you find out who your true friends are, the people who are still there for you through, through thick and thin. And, um, you know, luckily I had a wonderful support system and, um, I just guess that I realized that, one loss doesn't define me and and a win doesn't define me either. I mean, there's so much more to me than just the fighter that people see when I step into the octagon. There's so much that made me the person that I am to be able to even get to that point. Just even getting to the point where I step inside the octagon is a huge accomplishment. And there's so much to me 
that gets me to that point that I have to realize that regardless of the outcome of that one event, there's so much to be said about everything that I did to get to that point and all the life lessons and everything that that this sport has taught me. And so, um, you know, I just try to look at it that way. And I love the uh, saying that, you know, the past is a place of reference, not a place of residence. So that really resonates with me. And it it definitely hits home because I want to be able to reflect on my past and I want to be able to learn about it and better myself. But I don't want to live there. I don't want to stay in the past. I don't want to keep myself down. I don't want to not fight because of it. Um, you know, and I, I just want to do what makes me happy. And to be honest, um, as hard as it can be to take those big, heavy losses with the whole world watching, um, it's still rewarding in the sense that there's something still to be gained from it, even in the loss. And I think no one stays undefeated in life. So you just have to, to take it for what it is. And, Either you can learn from it or you don't, and some people are made for it and some people are not, but I still find, I still find some sort of, um, maybe satisfaction isn't the right word. I definitely don't feel satisfied after I lose, but there's something I still gain from it. So with that being said, I can still find some kind of positive to take away from it. So, um, and, and in connection with, you know, the win over Holly, um, obviously that was one of the most amazing days of my life. So it's chasing that dream that's addicting. And, um, you have to realize that there's going to be bumps along the road. I mean, it would be ignorant and and pretty silly of someone to think that you're just going to cruise to the top and, and stay there forever. Um, you know, some, some people have, um, be easier, better, or just are more talented or what are, you know, better work ethics. You know, some people have it maybe a little bit easier, but still like to get there is just still a hard road. It's still a long road regardless. And, um, you have to understand that there's going to be hardships when, when you pick something that's like a, a goal that very few people in the world would even consider much less be able to accomplish you have to realize that there's going to be a lot of adversity along the way. So, um, you know, I'm under no delusion in that sense that it's always going to be an uphill battle. It's always going to be hard, but I really enjoy challenging myself, um, in that respect. So I hope that answers your question. Um, next question, and hopefully I'm saying this name, right? I think it's Asia. Um, considering the fact that you had trouble cutting weight for the fight with Amanda, do you think it was because of the new diet you tried that was low on calories? Uh, you looked really tired and down, not like your usual self before a fight. By the way, you're my favorite fighter, and I think you're amazing at what you do. Love that you know how to take a loss and a win. Excited to see your next fight against Raquel. So um, the question part of that, um, it it was surprising to me that the weight cut was actually as difficult as it was because it wasn't, I wasn't cutting any more weight than I normally do. And normally it's very easy. Um, I definitely don't think that it was diet at all. Um, weight is weight. And if anything, um, I was still eating a lot of calories, but I just limited the carbs and carbs hold water. So once you get to the point where you're going through dehydration, technically it should have been easier. Um, but I think it was just honestly stress. Just, I had a lot of things going on. Um, and I'm not so great at delegating or asking, asking people to help. So, um, sometimes I, I tend to, to overload myself and the people around me don't necessarily realize unless they're around me 24 seven that, um, I'm putting so much on myself. So I'm trying to work on that. I'm trying to definitely ask for, you know, more help and delegate things and, and whatnot. But I just think I, I had a lot on my plate, had a lot of things going on in my personal life and, um, you know, it's life, it happens and it just probably wasn't convenient timing for me. Um, but I wasn't going to back away from a challenge, obviously. And like, that's no excuse. You know, everyone has, life issues and more difficult times than others. But, um, that, you know, that was just a little bit harder of a time for me period. And I think, you know, 
stress hormones being released. Like I never realized that that could affect a weight cut, but you know, I've talked to um, my doctor and done some research myself and stress, um, doesn't, it doesn't want to like let sweat out of your body. Like a lot of times it help makes you retain water and, and I'm, um, a pretty relaxed person for the most part. But like I said, I just felt very over- overloaded in everything that I had going on. So obviously no, far from my best performance. And, um, I know that I have a lot more to give and hopefully one day, um, I can get that rematch. Um, but you know, the fight ahead, is Raquel, which I'm very honored to have. I think Raquel is a great fighter. And um, we're going to be fighting UFC 205 in New York. And um, that's been a dream of mine in itself as well. I mean, years ago, I was being asked questions about what I want to fight in New York. And, and I had contacted the UFC and said, you know, I that I would like to if um, there was any availability. And at that time, it looked like the card was already full. And then a spot opened up and they offered it to me and obviously I'm, I'm there in a heartbeat. So I'm, I'm actually really excited to fight before the holidays this year (laughs) because normally I end up fighting, um, like on the new year's card. And it just, it's really hard because you miss out on so much. Um, people don't realize, you know, when you're in that heavy, heavy part of, of training camp, you know, you're missing out on a lot of the Thanksgiving experience and you surely miss out on Christmas Um, so it's just really hard to go through that year after year after year. And, um, this is going to be wonderful to get this, uh, fight all done and in the books, November 12th, be able to enjoy the holidays a little bit. And, um, I'm really looking forward to that. So next question, um, Benjamin said, we've seen a number of times in the UFC where fighters with personal relationships outside the business are hesitant to fight each other in the octagon. Is your relationship with Juliana Pena one where you might only fight each other if the championship was at stake? Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, something that we've both made pretty clear and pretty public. Um, you know, I just, I love Juliana. Her and I are both from Washington state. Um, you know, we used to train together well before the UFC was even, um, even consideration. Yeah. I mean, there was no women fighting the UFC and they were very vocal that there would never be women fighting in the UFC. And, you know, we used to train together way, way, way back. So obviously we've been friends for a long time and, uh, former training partners. And so I just, I, I want obviously her to do as well as possible. I want, I want to do as well as you know, possible for myself as well. With that being said, obviously we are in the same weight division and we both have the goal of capturing the belt, um, you know, for myself again and for her the first time. But, um, we, we are really adamant about avoiding each other until that, that pivotal moment, um, where one of us has the belt and one of us is the contender. And at that point, you know, the, the relationship has to be, come it has to come second so um it'll it'll continue to come first and until if and when we would meet each other at, at that time for the belt then um i think that we would opt to not fight each other that's what um, we've communicated with each other and that's definitely our our standpoint all right next question is andrew um let's see cool glad you're still doing it i wasn't sure um, what other sports do you follow? Oh, he's just talking about the podcast. Yeah, no, I'm still doing the podcast. I love doing the podcast. I just, like I said, needed a little time for myself. So yes, still doing the podcast every Monday, Misha Monday. Um, and then he says, uh, what other sports do you follow? Well, I follow American football because it sounds like you're from Australia reading the rest of this as any plans on coming back to Australia at some point. Um, obviously a big Seahawks fan from Washington state myself, um, just got to love and support the team and I enjoy watching. And I think that I would really enjoy, um, like uh, hockey and rugby if it was more prominent or more promoted in the States, but it's just kind of hard to follow. And I'm so busy anyways, but, um, I've been to like two hockey games, really enjoyed it. And I also, um, oh, I watched rugby on, uh, on, the TV. And I just think it's, uh, it's cool. It's like a really fun sport, but I, I don't quite understand it 
in, in its entirety, but I do enjoy watching it. And whenever it's on, I find myself looking at the TV and like paying attention less to what people are saying at the dinner table. But <laughs> it's a, it seems like it's a pretty cool sport. Oh, oh, and any plans on coming back to Australia? Absolutely. Oh, I'm definitely coming back to Australia. Australia was very cool. And uh, I have a friend of mine, Dylan Resnikov, who lives in Australia. Um, and they, um, him and his brother own a gym called VT1 Academy. Um, so there's really great training out there for me as well. So definitely, definitely plan on coming back. Um, but that's in Sydney. I'm not sure where you're located. All right. Next question is Robbie. What do you find worse, nagging little injuries that hamper your training or big ones that keep you out of training altogether? Um, honestly, I kind of prefer the big injuries in a weird way because the nagging injuries are something you're always trying to train through and oftentimes you make them worse or you aren't sure like and you end up pushing yourself too hard and they become big injuries, which is just it's frustrating. It's just irritating when you're kind of like on that teetering line and you're maybe in a training camp and you're really trying to push hard, but not too hard. And then you have to limit what you're doing and you have to constantly worry that like, is this going to get worse? I mean, when it's a big injury, it's like clear cut and dry, you know what you're in for. And like, it forces you to limit yourself to where you can get healthy again. So, um, I'd rather just like have a big one and get it over with than have something that's like persistently ongoing that you have to try to baby and try to work through and inconvenience your training partners with like, Oh, don't, you know, do this or don't do that because I'm hurt. You know, it's just, um, and it wears on your patience when you have like a long nagging injury, it's just maddening. So, um, yeah, I would go with the big one, get it over with. <laughs> um, oh, my, that's the name. My asks many women in the bantamweight division are seeking out title shots. Who do you think is the next deserving candidate against Amanda Nunes? Well, depending on if and when Ronda comes back, uh, you know, obviously I think if she wanted to come back and fight for the title, cool. But um, it's still so up in the air, so I'm just going to answer the question as though Ronda is out of the picture. Um, I think Juliana Pena is next. Um, she's won all her fights in the UFC, and she's the first female fighter on the Ultimate Fighter uh, to win the Ultimate Fighter, excuse me. And um, she's a great fighter, and I think she possesses everything that you could ask for for a contender. So... I think that rightfully so she should be next in line and, um, you know, hopefully that's what we'll see. And, um, I think Amanda needs to, uh, to, to stay busy. I think she needs to defend her belt and not, you know, not wait for Rhonda. That's my opinion. Um, because I think, you know, the true champ gets in there and, and gives the, um, proves that, that why they're the champ, you know? So I don't know what her plans are. Um, you know, I'm not saying that she's, she's waiting for on, I don't know, but, um, I think if Juliana is ready to go that, um, her and Amanda should, should have a go at it. So that's my opinion. Danny is asking, he says, great to have you back in the cage and back with the podcast, Misha. Uh, what sort of music do you listen to when you go on to get fired up? And what do you listen to to relax? So um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Eminem. I love his music. I'm very lyrically inspired because it's kind of like listening to a motivational speech and music at the same time. So anything that's really empowering. I'm also a big fan of Nicki Minaj because, again, lyrically, she's just so talented and just has a lot of songs about pushing through adversity and overcoming those things and people trying to hold you down and just life messages and life, you know, life problems, um, that, that can occur for any person and just trying to get over those hurdles in life. Love that. Um, also like Lincoln park a lot. It's just kind of a little bit more rock and heavy and, um, you know, that's fun to work out for me as far as relaxing music. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty open. Honestly, I'm, I'm not a, um, not a very picky person when it comes to music. Obviously it was relaxing. I don't want anything that's going to make me want to (laughs) dance. So, um, yeah, I, I'm pretty open. I I can't say that I I necessarily have one type of music. Let's see. Okay. 
I'm sure that I'm going to say this name wrong, but um, it's Adelard, I think, says, uh, Hi, Misha. I have two questions for you, but first and foremost, I want to tell you how much I admire you for who you are and what you do in and out of the ring. Well, thank you. Um, Number one, I remember you saying that some of the bruises look worse than they really are. There must be bruises that are worse than they appear to be. Um, yeah, um, that's, yeah, that's true. Um, sometimes a lot of the bruises, metaphorically speaking, are internal. They are, um, bruises that people don't see on the outside. And, um, so, so there's definitely bruises that happen from fights and losses and things like that, that people don't really see that you carry the burden of healing on your, you know, on your own or just with your close friends. But that's fair to say. And then sometimes, uh, you know, really, realistically speaking, a bruise will look terrible on the outside. You see a bruise on the leg or whatever. And I'm like, meh, doesn't even bother me. So it it's definitely works both ways. There's um, more to bruising physically and metaphorically speaking than meets the eye. Okay. We have Jonathan asking, was there added pressure when your fight against Amanda Nunes got moved to the main event at UFC 200. Oh, of course. I mean, there was definitely added pressure. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but like it was welcomed. I, I definitely don't, don't, um, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't feel like it was going to make a difference in, in my fight performance. And, and I don't think that it did. Um, I mean, the, the fight was going to happen either way. So it, it does, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter if it was semi co-main event, co-main event or main event. Um, it, you know, it's still the same fight. So I didn't really look at it as a negative. Um, you know, but yeah, you know, I had a, had a lot on my plate. I had a lot of things going on otherwise. And, um, hopefully I, I think that most of my fans know that that's, definitely far from a typical experience for myself. Um, so I know I have a lot more to give and granted I work myself, work, work back to that rematch. I'm positive, um, you know, that I can put on a much better fight than that. And I'm confident that I can get it to go the other direction and, and avenge a loss. Um, so that's definitely on my to-do list and, um, hopefully, sooner than later, you know, I want to get back in there, fight, stay busy, um, and, and work my way back to avenging losses and getting the title back. That's what I want. Okay. Dean says, um, what's the worst thing about losing your first title defense after you worked so hard to obtain the belt? Um, there's a lot of terrible things to be honest, Dean. Um, you know, but like, again, like going back to can you cannot, define yourself with one loss or one win regardless. And, um, I just got caught early in that fight and, um, I wasn't, you know, I just, I wasn't there like a hundred percent the way that I wanted to be. And, um, you know, that's no one to blame, but myself, like I have to take that responsibility and it's my, it's my fault for like not making sure things were going differently or better leading up to it. So I have to take a hundred percent of the accountability and, um, yeah, with, you know, it's, it's sucked. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it really, su- it always sucks to lose a fight, but, but I believe in myself to get back through, through those tough times and get back to the top and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really phase me that many other people tell me otherwise or see it otherwise that, you know, um, I'm done or I see a lot of comp- comments that I should just retire. Well, you know, wait and see when I get in there and I fight Raquel UFC 205, you know, then we're going to have people jumping back on the bandwagon. So it's all good. Um, it's part of it. Um, but, but, um, I'm far from done and that was definitely probably the worst, um, performance of my fight career. So, um, I feel definitely safe in saying I have a lot more to offer than that. And I definitely feel like, um, that's not too far fetched. So I'm going to go out there and prove that on, um, November 12th. I'm very excited to get in there and do it. Jacqueline is asking, how do you find the energy to do so much physical activity in one day with a smile on your face? Ha, Jacqueline, you must be uh, seeing my Snapchats. 
Um, for those of you interested in following me on Snapchat, it's just Misha Tate UFC and that's M I E. But, um, I just enjoy being physically active. I feel at my best. I feel like I, you know, I look my best. I feel my best. I just feel really good about myself. And, um, yeah, I, I, I enjoy being outdoors. I enjoy doing those things. And so a lot of times being physical puts a smile on my face as opposed to like, if I was just laying around doing nothing, I'd probably be like depressed, (laughs) but, um, not that it can't be hard or be vigorous or wear you out or, you know, take your smile away when you're in the middle of, of the, the hard, hard workout. But at the end of it all, once it's done, I always feel better than I did, um, before I did it. So, yeah. All right. Um, coming to the last two questions, Jose is asking, what do you say to those that feel extreme? Um, Oh, feel the extreme weight cut you guys go through is dangerous to your body. And then in parentheses, but those videos are scary. Um, well, I can't argue that. I definitely think weight cutting is bad for the body and not good for, um, not good for people. I mean, you can't argue that. No, nobody's going to argue that it's, it is dangerous and it's really bad for your body and it's taxing on it. And so is getting punched in the face, I'm sure. So, I mean, we picked a, a very demanding sport. It's very demanding on our bodies and, um, the weight cuts are, are difficult. You know, they can be difficult. They can be really challenging and very hard on your body, but, um, it's just part of it, I guess. It's what, what we're accustomed to doing. So, uh, we try to make it as easy as possible and, you know, make the hydration process as um, you know, as effective as possible and refueling, but yeah, it's, it's not good for you. I can't lie. But I, I also think that, you know, picking a contact sport where, you know, we take head trauma and blows to the body and, you know, it's common for people to break ribs and tear knees and blow out their backs and all kinds of, um, of things, you know, that's also probably, I'm, I'm going to say probably not good for your body either. So <laughs> I guess it's just a matter of choice. You know, nobody's making us do it, but I hear what you're saying. And uh, last question from Jarek is, uh, how's my nose? Um, yeah, obviously I suffered a broken nose the last fight. It's not the first fight. Probably won't be the last fight that I suffered a broken nose. It's uh, more annoying than anything in the healing process because it's just hot and inflamed and it just, it's, it's just annoying to be honest. It, it's, you can't sleep that well and like it's always running and it's just, it's, it's not even so much the, the, I mean, it doesn't hurt when I, you know, anytime that I've broken my nose in a fight, I don't feel pain from it. It's just annoying. And, um, the heat, the healing process, like and having the puffy eyes and puffy sinuses and not being able to breathe for, you know, a couple of weeks is pretty irritating. But, um, to answer your question, no, it's fine now it's, it's healed up and, it's uh, definitely not my first rodeo with a broken nose. So, you know, it's um, one of those things that I'm accustomed to dealing with and it's part of fighting and it happens and I'm okay with that. Um, one day, once I retire, I'll probably get it fixed, <laughs> put, put all back together. But for the time being, I'm just going to let it be. And uh, if I break it again, then I break it again. But um, no big deal. It's it's part of it. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys for listening. Um, you know, it's definitely, uh, really, it's like a weight off my chest to just be able to talk about all this. You know, it's been a little while since I felt comfortable really opening up and even, you know, wanting to discuss this, these kinds of things. And, you know, I appreciate the, the true honest questions. Um, you know, I, I definitely don't shy away from the difficult ones. I, I, my goal with this, podcast and the Misha Tate show is to be transparent, you know, is to be as transparent as possible to allow you guys to see more of, of the real Misha Tate, not just the one that's the fighter. Um, so I am not trying to sugarcoat anything. I'm not trying to, to, um, you know, cause any illusions by any means. Like I, I really just want people to get a sense of the real me and who I am. And that's what this whole show is about. So, I appreciate you listening. I appreciate the questions. Thank you guys so much. And um, until next week.
Uh, I guess I'll, you guys will hear from me later. Bye.